Welcome to the Tippy Top Entrepreneur Experience. Hey, hi, Alex. It's uh, randomly we met, didn't we, in London? I just stood next to you and we, we got to know each other. So uh, just before Christmas, it was, a, it was a great meeting. Thank you. Absolutely. No. So, yeah, Peter Cowley on the show today, the invested investor. And what an honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much. An honor to be on the show. You've got my TV top, interesting name. I haven't really worked out why it's called that, but maybe we'll talk about that. Absolutely, we will. Um, and as you said, we, we met briefly last year in 2021. And uh, just to give the listeners a bit of a sense of who we're talking to, you get angels, you get super angels, and then you get Peter. Now, Peter, as you can, for the, the listeners on, on YouTube, you'll see has made a colossal number of investments, as you'll see in the background, and founded a handful, a large handful of startups. And suffice to say, I think Peter's seen every scenario that possibly is to see in the game. Um, and Peter, can I pass on to you to just tell us a little bit more about your background? Yes. OK, so I was brought up in Hull in Yorkshire, and I, I ended up studying and being very geeky and actually quite introverted uh, at school, ended up at Cambridge University, did engineering, didn't enjoy that particular, did computer science, worked for a software company for a bit in, in the UK, and then moved up to Bavaria. And the point is I joined a supplier to a project we are working on, and the point there is I, 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 the company was sold to somebody and I formed my first company then, back in 81. So between 81 and now, it's 40 odd years, it was actually two handfuls. So it's about it's over a dozen companies that have formed in tech, and in property. So, and it, 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 I always say that I actually made more money out of speculative building houses about 20 years ago than I'd made out of anything else in tech until recently. And uh, just recently, the ancient investing career has become lucrative. I don't do it for money necessarily, but I do it for people. I do it for spending time with people, but it's quite nice to see some good returns so it is actually possible to make good returns with energy investing basically um so i've done a lot of charity work i've been on seven boards um so i've done social enterprises i understand really well and then about um 14 years ago i accidentally became an angel and accidentally because i invested in somebody i was mentoring and it was only during that journey we had a, an exit of about 14x after two or three years not not a huge amount of money doesn't matter lots of learning uh, he worked out I was an angel. So, <laughs> and then, so I'm in Cambridge, uh, UK, and uh, I joined the Cambridge Angels, of which I've been heavily involved with, the chair and everything. And that's the group that taught me, really. That it was the people that were further ahead of me on their Asian investing that I learned from. Of course, I've been for a long time a teacher, hence what we're talking now. So I've done other things. Um, I've, um, uh, I've actually been on 37 different boards of various sorts. So I've been to 1,000 plus board meetings, some of which have been fun and some not so fun, et cetera. But I'm also slightly different from other angels. I'm very willing to help the whole ecosystem. So many angels are concentrating on their portfolio or money return. But I, I've been I, actually helping uh, awarded Angel of the Year about seven or eight years ago, uh, which then gave me some credibility. From that, I jo I've been on three trade bodies, the UK, as president of the European trade body, and uh, at the moment I'm on the board of the Global Business Central Network, which is based in, in Washington. So I've done that, and then I decided to give more and more back, so giving lectures, writing a couple of books, as you can see behind, we'll talk about those later. I've made over 75 investments, I've had 12 exits, which are positive. I've had I've got three going on at the moment uh, because when you've got a big portfolio, the four, nearly 50 left, stuff happens, stuff fails and stuff succeeds. And I've only had 17 failures. So overall, I'm, um, you know, percentage wise, which is we'll talk about later, which is one to three, I'm getting on for 50-50, uh, which is really unusual. And not, yeah. not all big exits, of course, mm. <laughs> but it's good to see them coming out. And the, my sort of, and we'll, again, we'll talk about this later, my motto really is transparency. So mm. transparency, trust, truth, really, the three, I've never mm. said that before, three T's, it sounds like things to say. Great. No, amazing. And, and as I say, really excited for this episode and 75 angel investments, that is phenomenal. 
um, and with all the exits to boot and, you know, failures. That's where you really learn, I guess, and, and see everything in between. So real treat for, for myself and the listeners. And I must stop and, and answer that question about the tippy top, where it comes from. It's uh, it's actually an inside joke my friend and I had a while back. So, you know, where are we going? It was like career and life. We're going to the tippy top. It's literally, you know, the best of the best, um, everything you can achieve and more. Um, and there's more to read on my website, the, the tippytop.com, if you want to find a bit more about the tippy top blog initially vlog and now recently the podcast but thanks for asking and thanks again for being on the show now we've got three main topics and i, I picked peter's brain for his three areas of expertise uh passion and maybe some bugbears as well and we came up with with these three so team dynamics is number one uh, number two very thought provoking is your startup is more likely to fail with investors than without really looking forward to that session and then very interesting one bad behavior at all stages by funders and then to a lesser extent by founders so that's going to be great so let, let's crack in with number one team dynamics now peter as part of your three t's you use the word truth tell us more truth so um in the end not the end uh, if I'm investing in a very early stage startup, I'm not investing in a plan, I'm investing in the people. So it's people with a plan, not a plan with people. And it really annoys me if I get a deck where the people are not mentioned to the end, or occasionally the people aren't even mentioned. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, it's the people at very early stage. If this data is a bigger company, it's moving on, you've got customer acquisition cost, lifetime value stuff there, that's very, very different. So, but in order to build up the relationship so you can invest, you need to build up trust and trust requires truth. You know, you need to understand that these people, the founders, which are all very, you know, passionate, driven, et cetera, will also be truthful within, you know, they're, they're obviously slightly de delusional, all founders are delusional because they're, they're basically selling something they haven't done yet. Uh, you know, you take the ultimate Steve Jobs, you know, <laughs> Um, the reality distortion, they used to say. So, yeah, certainly accept that they're going to say things or, or promise things that, you know, you think, well, that's unlikely to happen, possibly, or hopefully it will do. But if, as long as they're met, they are truthful at that point, and we come to this with due diligence in a minute, um, and then uh, you can build up the relationship, you can build up the trust, and therefore you can invest. But that isn't just pre-investment, where you've got a choice whether to invest or not. Mm. That's post investment so continuing the ability the, the entrepreneurial ability to continue to tell the truth even if it's bad news and bad news is really important because if they need more money in a hurry or not in a hurry if they don't share the bad news it's going to be really difficult to invest and sometimes they don't share any news at all but it's a different yeah. story <laughs> I had one company two and a half years after we invested nothing came out of them and then it suddenly came out came out to us for cash no, <laughs> no way. So the truth is, it's again, so it's transparency. It's, it, it, I'm very open about things. Um, PeterCowley.org is well worth having a look at that if you get a chance. That's got all my investments, all my criteria, all my exits, all my failures, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I come from Yorkshire. Maybe it's just something to do with being, coming from up north. I don't know. You, you were uh, uh, from South Africa, aren't you, I think? Okay. Probably pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the truth, though. Yeah, no, no, agreed. Yeah, yeah, we're also a very open culture and very expressive. So yeah, good, good to hear. Now, you, you mentioned trust in that as well. Why is that so important? And particularly with the investor startup relationship, you've mentioned follow on funding, what else? Yeah, so this is bi-directional. So first of all, we as angel investors are investing people, and therefore we need to build up trust in those people. However, also, you, I'm sorry, I'm talking to you because you're younger than me, that's all, that's the only reason that I usually invest in younger people, um, is, uh, and you've become familiar with this podcast, of course, as well, although it may not be monetizable, that's another story, um, is uh, you've got to trust us, you've got to, that we will pay ourselves, and we again, we'll talk about this later on, the, um, because the very things you need from us, obviously you need cash, and if you just need pure cash, go the crowdfunding route, because, you know, uh, there are lots of disadvantages in doing that, but pure cash. And um, the 
cash is important. I, 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 I have three terms here, dumb cash, which is super unfair, smart cash and toxic cash. And having dumb cash, this is cash that doesn't necessarily contribute anything in terms of skills or connections, is still really important. Take nowadays where the rounds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and for having cash there. So it's not, not a downside to have cash that's not getting smartness attached to it. Mm -hmm. But of course, smartness makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. So checking on us and how we are going to behave, taking references on us as investors uh, in terms of how much we can add value, how much time we might waste. Uh, and again, we talk about some pretty bad, very bad actually behavior later on from investors. No, super. Great. No, very helpful. And I've never heard those three terms of the different types of cash. And, and hopefully you get the, the middle one, the smart cash, um, all the entrepreneurs out there. Now, uh, investor DD processes on the founders. What's best practice, especially at the early stage? Um, I'm known for being um, doing pretty deep dives straight away. So if I see a team, uh, there are two main sources of information about the members. One is their LinkedIn. Of course, LinkedIn is a sales document. The only person who can, can edit it is the person themselves. Um, and they're sure to be, probably even on mine, actually, there's sure to be stuff that I've omitted or I've put on there. I don't know if you looked at mine. It's far too long a road. <laughs> um, too, too many things I've done over the years. Um, so, that, so looking at that, and then generally, unless they just come straight over uni, There'll be some fingerprint somewhere on the internet, usually on a company's house. Mm -hmm. So company's house will give journeys and you get lots of phoenixes of people trying stuff again, which in itself isn't a problem. Again, I, you'll see on my website, I, I state that I'd rather invest in a, an entrepreneur who's tried before and failed than one who hasn't tried yet, uh, providing they're open and honest and transparent about the failure. And that really means 90 plus percent of the time blaming, if there's blames involved, themselves, and not somebody else. It's very, very rare for a company to fail uh, because there's not been a management issue of some form. Mm. So that's so that's the online. And there's other things as well. I remember into looking at a company and, and doing actually finding his Facebook. I don't know why it was open and finding he was a wingsuit jumper. <laughs> you know, you know the, the and just going, can we ever talk about that? I'm just see where the risk involved in that. Uh, I think it's a wingsuit jumper, I can't what it's called. Um, and, and Twitter and all the other things and et cetera, et cetera. So this is building up the desk research, you know, the secondary research. Mm -hmm. And the primary research is done by time with the entrepreneurs. And mm -hmm. again, on my website, it says 5.2 months from point of contact to close, generally, on average, over, um, and that's usually a couple months of legals and three months of getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. So this is time. This is challenging, not, not in a formal way. And, and newbie angels will go, how on earth do you work out whether it's going to be a good entrepreneur or not? And it's really difficult because it's government. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of government mm -hmm. involved, a lot of time. So mm -hmm. what I say there is follow other people, chat to other people, learn from other people. And that's why belonging to an angel group, if you can do, makes a big difference in the rest of it. And um, the other thing, of course, is taking references. Mm -hmm. So, you know, references as in, it's very easy here in Cambridge, we're only 150,000 people, and there's probably most of our entrepreneurs, I suspect. So, so it's, you know, but, but of course, I keep saying, particularly if I'm involved with European discussions, it, we are so lucky here. In, well, lucky in the UK, and mm -hmm. even lucky in Cambridge. You know, Cambridge is really the epicenter of startup and, and possibly successes for its size. You know, it's 70 times smaller in London um, than. Uh, yeah, than, than anywhere else in Europe. So these are the primary and secondary research. Mm, and, yeah. That, that's a great deal of DD, even just, you know, for, for an angel uh, and, and no ordinary angel. But uh, I think a lot of people expect that just institutions do that kind of DD. But it's really refreshing to hear that it happens right at the early stage, especially with an investor you would want on your cap table. Some might do less. But uh, yeah. And, and you mentioned that all startups fail typically to do with some kind of management issue. I just want to pick on that for a point because CB Insight says it's all about failing to raise follow-on funds. And I think you know, that's largely often because of management and B, no market need. But would you put team management issues ahead of all of that because it encapsulates everything that a startup actually does? Yeah, but when, who, who else can get those two things wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, those, those are actually prime examples of management failure. The ones that people talk about are big, bad debts. 
So you've built up a business and it goes bust. But in my view, that's still a huge management failure because mm. you've given credit to somebody you really shouldn't have done. When I candidate, my business went bust about 30 years ago, and we'd given credit to a company. Actually, no, you went to another company, but it was the main supplier of IT to Next. Um, uh, but in fact, as it turned out, it was owned enough by Next, which is a quoted company, that they had to pay off all the debts. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> they owed us a lot of money. And they paid us off after we'd gone bust. <laughs> so they paid it off to the bank, <laughs> not, didn't allow us to get, carry on trading. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, we we didn't put us under that. It was something else. It was a horrendous recession at the end of the 80s, early 90s, which we were probably too young to remember. Mm -hmm. um, but so, yeah, bad debts, internal fraud, that's slightly more difficult. You know, the, the busy three Valerie situation, mm -hmm. you know, there's quite a few of those where mm -hmm. really difficult to work out. And we don't know what the result of that is, but it does feel like there was some senior management uh, greed in there. That's mm -hmm. a difficult one. Mm -hmm. But generally, it's the, it's, it's the management. You can only blame the founders. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've learned that one through the School of Hard Knocks myself. Yeah, I won't invest in an entrepreneur that isn't good at fundraising because that is, if that's the number one mechanism for failure, your job is that salesperson getting the investors, getting the trust, getting the investment in. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, can yeah. I just comment on that though? Yes, because I agree, uh, the hustler, the salesperson needs to sell equity, they need to sell vision to early employees, so they don't pay very much, they need to sell to customers, all the other things. However, selling equity doesn't give you the rights to build a big business. Mm. And a great example happened with a guilty verdict on Elizabeth Holmes last week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. Great example. Great example indeed. Um, now, let's talk about losing co-founders. So no one expects it to happen and they never put in long enough vesting periods. Uh, but it seems to be quite a frequent occurrence. Tell us a bit more, Peter. Yeah, I actually say that. I, I don't actually agree with the long enough vesting periods. Okay. Personally, uh, I mean, you can't have the length of the company vesting period, can you really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a three-year that's possibly reset by an incoming VC, mm -hmm. this is reverse vesting, of course, not vesting, mm -hmm. um, is, which the audience might understand, but Google it. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, is three years possibly reset, though we don't normally reset as angels after three years, but mm -hmm. VC do, should tie people in. But of course, it doesn't mean you're going to not lose them. It just means you have a process for ensuring the shares end up back with the company, uh, non-voting, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they can use those shares again to try and find some senior management to replace them. I've got some stats in front of me. I updated it yesterday, actually, and it's uh, even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so of the total number of 75 companies, I've lost 20% um, uh, of the founders have gone. So 30 people out of 150. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 23 companies, that's 31% of all my investments have had lost at least one co-founder, mm -hmm. and in some cases, all co-founders. So that's the downside. The upside, actually, is um, that 57% uh, of my investments, where they've lost one or more co-founder, are doing well. Um, so losing co-founder can either be uh, removal for non-performance, mm -hmm. Or, um, uh, or they leave, of course. Um, I don't cast class losing co-founder where they get demoted to a different, well, demoted, move sideways to a different role from CEO to CPO or you know, whatever, not CTO probably. Um, I don't class this as losing co-founder. I'm, I'm talking about people who are no longer involved. Um, so say 57% doing better, 30% have failed since, um, you know, so they've lost a co-founder and then failed. And there's a few that are sort of doing okay. Uh, so, but of course, these are all statistics. There's vast amount of emotion involved in this, particularly if you uh, whether whether they're leaving themselves, which is slightly less likely, or they're being asked to leave. And I've had grown men in tears over this, and mm. it's really tough. And so there's the combination of the the fact it's their baby, you know, mm. really, you know, um, and they're being asked to leave or something. Um, uh, actually, one recently where um, no, I better mention it actually. No, no, it's too, too, too close. Um, but anyway, the founder's still there. The co-founder's still there, but wasn't at one point. Um, the 
so yes, there's the emotional aspect of it, and that can be really tough. Mm -hmm. People can fight against it, and then there's a process bit, process bit of it. And one, just to give you an example, uh, though we didn't do it, I, I would not invest in a husband and wife team, but I have done <laughs> more than once. And the next round we were talking about, which was closed fairly recently, talking about having sort of post nup. So this is, you can imagine a husband and wife team start divorcing emotionally breaking up how do you hold that company together so although you can't do the emotional side of it you can't write that down you can do process post and talk about it when you know i don't know what your marital state is or anything but i've been through two divorces sorry and uh <laughs> so you got a ring on <laughs> um the um yes yeah, so you could if you were to talk about it which is tough of course uh, pre um, problems and leading mm -hmm. something down writing which you can then take out of the drawer which you don't want to have to do etc so losing co-founders is unfortunately very common it's more common with more founders so investing in business has got four founders which i'd really struggle with it's rare that they'll stay the course because mm -hmm. um the um because there's misalignment there's too much overlap of skill sets etc etc so they tend to slide downwards which is why in principle two that are strongly bonded together because they've known each other a while and work together that the trust is really strong is best and three is second best one is really difficult to invest in although that doesn't mean you can't build a big business you know like richard branson or something without a co-founder yeah absolutely okay so that's your main bit of advice on that Try go for two co-founders, not your wife or brother, presumably. <laughs> well, no, 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 emotionally involved. Actually, I mean, there is obviously emotional involvement with one's siblings yeah. or even one's parents, yeah. but it's specifically the um, the fact that the emotional relationship is breaking down at the same time, and the complexity of coping with all that at the same time as trying to run the business. That's the biggest. Absolutely. Issue. Well, there. Great. Okay, good. Let's move on to topic number two. So very interesting one. Your startup is more likely to fail with investors than without. Uh, and I'd never really heard it expressed that way, but it's undoubtedly true. Um, and we've spoken about this number one uh, reason for failure, startups failing to raise follow on funds. And that's a bit of a dichotomy with the fact that if there's investors around the table and they're not watching it fail, how does that work? Do you want to talk us through that? Um, yes. So first of all, when you get investors like me around um, and VCs and everything, we drive for growth strongly because, you know, VCs particularly want to knock the ball out of the park or they want their dragon to replace the fund and blah, blah, blah. Um, angels much less. They're, they're much more willing to take a small return. You know, it's a numbers game in the end. Um, it, it's not just the, the, the 20x, it's lots of three and four x over time. You know, it's, it's an IRR play for, a, um, in my view, for an angel, not a multiple play. And of course, IRR comes out with multiples, you know, a, a 10 year with a 3x is not very much. And, and a two year with a 3x is a big IRR. So it's return capital employed, basically. Um, so drive for growth. They've got to bear in mind that um, investors put money in. They don't want profits to be made. They want it all to be reinvested. So there's push, 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 push costs up, deliver on extra costs, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get to the point then where cash has gone in, cash has started to run out, which is always the case. It's a sort of tooth, of course, a journey if you need more than one round, which is almost exclusively nowadays the case. What happens is cash is running out and the investors are losing faith in the founders. But I'm saying you've, you've seen it, you know, we're talking to the audience here, really. Um, so A, the founders and the board, of course, because they want, don't want it to fail. The board is there for the company not for the founders, you know, they do their best to try and work out how to do that, whether it's a pivot, whether to make some changes, whether, you know, pricing and all the other things you can do. But say it's getting to the point where, I mean, if it's really fundamental, like a drug discovery company where the drug doesn't work, that's a different matter altogether. We're talking something simpler than that. So um, the funding's getting tight, getting towards the end. Money's not really coming internally. How does one raise externally if internals are not investing, particularly if they're bigger investors? So some, some um, VCs, and maybe yours does as well, 
get really touchy about being too big on the cap table because you don't follow on. Even the message you're giving is huge. And that's actually true of the investor director, angel investor director. If the angel investor director doesn't follow on, he gives a message. Now, I have a rule that says I don't invest if the valuation, or I don't invest much nowadays anyway, uh, above 8 million. Uh, because if I'm putting, my numbers are small, it's 20, 30, 40K. I'm not a 200K guy. So if I'm putting, you know, this is a 2 million round, I'm putting 20K, and that's going to make a difference at all. But I have the rule that she's transparent so that I can back out at that valuation. Now, 8 million 10 years ago was a lot of money. <laughs> Nowadays, it's a pre seed. <laughs> no, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's, it's only a seed. Um, so, money ring out. Um, where did it go? So, there's three scenarios. One is fail, obviously, fail and hopefully solvently. I've, in the book, there's quite a lot about that. I really hate companies failing insolvently, insolvently, insolvently. Don't mind the shareholders losing the money, but I don't want the milkman to lose money or the staff to lose money or, or the government to lose money. So getting it timely right to solvently close is tough, really tough. Um, because you, you think you're going to raise, you think you're going to raise, you, you've built up a negative balance sheet because of holiday pay, rent, server cut, and all the rest of it, really difficult. So fail is one of them. Secondly is sale. Who wants to sell a company in a hurry? A forced sale could have a 20x reduction in uh, value. You want, to, you want to be bought, really. We're not talking about exits today, but you need to be bought rather than sell. Or thirdly, is to, is, assuming you've got sales, is to reduce the size to some sort of breaking, um, which people do in steps, of course. So you've really only got three options here. And that's what I'm saying. If you don't have the investors around the table, which, of course, means you can't have a drug discovery company because you can't have customers on day one, um, invest, most investors, certainly the sort of the lake, I suppose, rather than the pond I, I swim in, uh, invest in scalable tech, not service businesses. So we, you know, people like service business, service business generally generate dividends, different sort of investing altogether. Um, so but service businesses can start without any cash, of course, um, you know, because they, they're selling a service from day one, they're selling the human beings from day one. But if you need to develop tech or markets or something like that, you need external investment. And external investment now, not so much in the last year or so, but for the seven, eight years was really easy to find. So that's what I'm saying. And investors will drive, will make a decision in the end to force a company to close uh, because they don't, they're not continuing to invest. Yeah. And and so the, the message to entrepreneurs is that, you know, keep the confidence of your investors. I mean, easier said than done, but that is paramount. If you're going on a deep J curve, accelerated growth journey, you can't back out halfway because you're going to need that extra fuel. Otherwise, you'll get reset, of course. I mean, I, there was a company, Oxford, I didn't invest in, had a 100x down round. It's doing quite well now. So two things, though. If you don't participate in the next round, you are wiped out. And if the investors, which they did in this case, have faith in the entrepreneurs, they got to top them up with options or something like that, or growth shares, which is a better way of doing it. So that's another story. Absolutely. Great. And do you want to just talk about the dynamic that you've seen with investors who have put money in, whether it be angels or VCs, and then they've not participated in the next round the investment has failed, the company's failed, they've lost that investment. How do investors rationalize that in the, in, you know, in the context of their track record of, you know, they want to be successful? Do you want to talk the entrepreneurs through that? Uh, are you um, talking about the brand of the investors here or what? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I haven't been asked that before. So as an angel, I don't believe one should have a brand that's success or failure. The only reason to have a brand of success would be you're more likely to be asked to join a cap table, uh, which of course happens in California. But that doesn't worry me in the slightest. I, I invest in people. I don't invest because I want to be proved to be a good investor. Mm -hmm. Very different from a VC. Mm -hmm. So a VC is using somebody else's money, not your own money, which means, of course, you don't lose any money, apart from maybe you've got a small LP section at the bottom. So, mm -hmm. So they are... If they, if they lose, if there's failure, they're, they're losing profit share, but also brand. So we come back to brand. And so the brand is there for raising the next fund. So for VCs, a failure has a negative effect, obviously on their own pocket when they don't have a success. But, you know, we, know, we all know it's a risky business. The more the, the brand itself. 
Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Um, and, and in terms of that, is there anything that the entrepreneur should be cognizant of when taking money then from VCs or from angels? Are they more protected then from, you know, with certain VCs because they want to preserve that track record and they'll put money in maybe when they shouldn't be? What's the, what have you seen with that? I want to, you know, obviously everyone will say we never throw good money after bad, but I'm sure it happens all the time. So what have you seen? Um, protect, what do you mean by protect that? That they, they don't want to lose the investment. So rather than it run out of cash, the investor director puts in another, you know, recommends another 2 million investment. It kicks the can down the road 24 months and then they might actually go in and get another job. And yes, the, the buck lies with the investment committee, but I'm sure that behavior happens a lot, but no one really talks about it. What have you seen? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it could be classed with hindsight from bordering it of, of, of overselling within their own organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. To be specific about that, um, there's no doubt that people get emotionally involved, drink the Kool-Aid, they say, if you're involved in the company. And uh, and I detect that, and I've done that as well. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I, I got a bit too involved, a bit, particularly if I um, get the relationship with the entrepreneurs is very strong. And so it's really conflict to be an investor director, remember. You're supporting the entrepreneurs as human beings, but if you get to know them well, you're supporting the company and you're also representing the investors. So in the end, you have these three roles. The corporate role is the board position and therefore um, protecting the company. Uh, but you've got a moral obligation, a legal obligation to um, protect your investors because you're representing them. And of course, there's a disparity in the share price between what the investors want to pay and what the company wants. And the founders obviously not the dilute it too much. So, yeah, there's a, um, it's certainly true that it's a complex piece of emotional and human behavior involved in following on like that. Um, mm -hmm. There's no right or wrong, clearly. It's all to do with story. Mm -hmm. And you can only work out the hindsight. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well said. Great. And, and coming back to the decision whether uh, founders should bootstrap or raise investment, uh, and I know that's a very broad question, but what's your view on that? Yeah, when you've got the FFF, the family, friends and fools, um, to start with, you've obviously got grants, you've got, um, which is very prevalent around Europe, which is keeping a whole load of companies alive, not so much in the UK, because uh, there's so much equity available. Um, there's the savings, you know, you know, we all know the, the story of those. Um, the, the point is, um, <laughs> I've, been, I've been at FFF twice, where we, um, we I went in early and had a down round <laughs> when some other money came in. A bit embarrassing, that to admit. Um, but anyway, you live in London. Right? Um, so the um, the point about using early money of any sort, you will increase the valuation because in the end, you want as founders, you want to sell as little of the company as possible. So I strongly recommend that cash comes in. You know, maybe even dumb cash in order to come with family cash or something like that. Um, as long as you don't pick up a, a nasty, toxic fool on the way, which <laughs> sat next to a woman to, about three years ago, pre COVID, at a dinner, and she'd had to leave Ireland to come to the UK to avoid her investor. Yeah. <laughs> he so, I mean, obviously, he was still on the cap table, uh, but it was just the fact that he lived in the same town. Um, terrible. Story. I don't know what happened after that. Anyway. I've got lots of stories. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. You're very interesting. So it's uh, so in terms of as they're going on, the, I've heard the other day someone said if you want to be uh, you know disrupt a market, go and raise a lot of equity. If you want to be rich, bootstrap your business because you'll get your money from customers. Do you have a view on that? Oh yeah, of course. And because it's a spectrum, and the spectrum is selling yourself as a software engineer and as a company and discovering a blockbuster drug, drug. You know, where do you get a customer from to discover a drug? You know, mm -hmm. it can cost billions. Well, you know, it's a startup because I've got some way of doing it. But it can certainly cost you um, a billion or, you know, at least cost you a billion. No, that's not even getting a market. That's just getting to the point where you're in human trials and it's starting to work. We get to market as well. You've got, and it's just impossible almost to go to flow to, you've got to sell to it. AstraZeneca or Merck or something like that. 
so yeah, it, it's um, in, of the what is other five million companies in the UK or something. There's probably about two or three hundred thousand of race equity, three or four hundred thousand. The rest are all bootstrap. These are fish and chip shops, your graphic designers, et cetera, et cetera. There's no, these, these are still entrepreneurs, you know, mm. just because they have sold in equity. <laughs> I went to an organization, but I was quite a senior in an organization, some on LinkedIn, some um, for a couple of years. And they did a survey of entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneur, somebody in the survey said, I'd rather sell my grandmother than sell equity to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that's clearly not true but it was an interesting statement yeah, absolutely no that's great um and that dovetails nicely into uh question bank three and we're talking about bad behavior by funders and to a lesser extent founders and hopefully we get to extract all those stories you have in your head mm -hmm. and some written down now um they always say not all investors are created equal uh, what's some of the worst behavior you've seen? And well, I know we're opening a big Pandora's box, but the, the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, okay, I've got a few written down here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to, some of these are pretty terrible actually. So there was an exit um, a while ago where, you know about drag along, but other people might not. So drag along is where not everybody signs the document to sell a company. And uh, in many cases, this drag along is usually seventy five percent. So usually, the what seventy five percent sell, the rest are dragged along. Now, the drag along process actually is, uh, which I've been through a couple of times, you've got to offer the company to the people who won't sign. I think you've got 21 days, and if they can find the same amount of money, which is zero chance, then then they buy it. Um, but it's so very common that um, the American, which is American buyer, they want everybody to sign so they don't get sued for something wrong. And we had a situation where one chap uh, refused to sign uh, because he was um, a complicated story, but it, basically he was going to lose money, and so he blackmailed them. So he demanded an amount of money from the company free exit to sign the bit of paper. And what, this is a sophisticated angel investor. What was that about? What was that about? Sorry. And then we had another one where I was at a board meeting. I my jaw went, uh, the board, one of the board members said, um, and it was, it was a good exit, uh, but he invested in the last round. There was a bit of a haircut on the last round. Like the share price was less than exit. He said, look, I've helped a lot on this board and everything. Can we do a special deal? You know, <laughs> I mean, obviously not, but it was just the audacity to ask that to the board was just phenomenal. Um, uh, yes, uh, so that's the drag along. There's um, other things, you know, simple thing, wasting time. You know, there's a lot of, time wasting uh, and actually one I heard just in the last two days actually um, it's um, doesn't matter who it is well obviously I'm not going to tell you who it is but these they got a, um, a financier who's out of the city into business which is to do with stuff to do with the city of London and he's threatening to sue the founders he's on the board he's threatening to sue the founders because they're not achieving their target sale <laughs> I've never heard that well, wow, because they 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 signed they signed up to the business plan and gave them false projections, I presume. Well, they weren't false. <laughs> they were projections. What projections are true? Come on, projections <laughs> are projections. Um, and in fact, I have heard of warrants being called upon. So, warrant there's, there's a company where the warrants were uh, it was going wrong. It was going to be coming. It was turning over several million. Warrants had called upon and they was getting legal and everything. And so the founder shut it down. So everybody lost. Wow. So I don't know the full story. I wasn't an investor, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's finish there. I've got probably about 30 stories I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Now, I think that the pertinent question is, what do founders do to protect themselves? As I said earlier on, it's reference checking. Mm -hmm. checking that, I mean, uh, one example here, I joined a board several years ago where I gave him three references. This is a founder, gave him three mm -hmm. references. He took those up and then he went through my LinkedIn and started contacting people wow. to see how I was going to behave. And I really valued that. 
Mm. Uh, obviously. But I, I did. I thought it was really good. It was it was a, a start of a good relationship as he really cared. And yeah. so I was joining the board. It wasn't my money. It was me being on the board. He was checking as a human mm. being. And you could help. But, and you would never do that for the long tailor investors, obviously. Mm. <laughs> But you know, and it's really it's much more easy, it's much easier for us as investors to do DD on you as an entrepreneur, vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well said. Okay, great. And now we've said bad behavior by funders, and we also need to talk about a few rogue founders. Uh, what have you seen? And I guess, but more importantly, what's the advice to founders? Yeah, so I've written a few things down here. Uh, Phoenix thing. Um, and in fact, if you look at the crowdfunding sites, there's more phoenixing going on there. I spoke down starting again using the same IP. You know, it happens whether they've got investors or not. So it's, it's just a typical bad behavior. Generally, it's the older founders that do that sort of thing. You know, when they get in hold. So um, uh, when I came to HR reformed, I did exactly by the book. So I contacted all the creditors. Made sure they're happy to be doing that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Most didn't reply, of course, because that went solvent, insolvently plus candidates in 1991. I learned a lot from that. There are very few angels that have had the level of failure <laughs> in personal business I have. So I've learned a lot from that. So it's in, it's in the book, <laughs> end of chapter one. Um, uh, obviously, lying and information flow, particularly information flow, um, you know updates and so on difficult to work that out this is to do with dd at the beginning to check they're going to behave like that um <laughs> and one guy we still operate here in cambridge that claimed he had a good exit um I assume, but it didn't seem quite right and he looked at company's house it didn't like a good exit um anyway i met his co-founder a couple of years later and he'd gone insolvently bust and that was a good exit <laughs> it's so difficult to um you know, well, anyway, I didn't invest, which does as well. Mm -hmm. um, defensive IP, I was on a final investor call where we are going to invest in something. And actually, one of there were a number of angels. And one of the angels who's was obviously a good, bit more, uh, quite a lot more technical than me, uh, well, I'm pretty technical, um, challenged them and said, I found this patent which has been granted in the States, which seems to be very similar to what you're working on. Now that they hadn't got a patent grant to that by a cybersecurity type thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And they said, oh, we know about that. We don't think it was worth releasing to you. Oh, wow. So the call ended in literally a couple of minutes, just politely goodbye. So um, uh, early customers, <laughs> I nearly invested in a, a company. There's a lot re other reasons for why I didn't. Um, but it turned out that the early customer, and he had early customer, was his cousin. You know, I, I think he should have said that <laughs> this was the connection here. So, you know, this, this stuff happens, you know. You know it's just, you know, it's this reality distortion, really, but it's mm. not. Got to, they've got to be, they've got to believe in something that is beyond the horizon. Otherwise, it's not going to be disruptive enough to invest. Mm. Okay, and and any summary thoughts, you know, advice for entrepreneurs out there in terms of, you know, I don't think anyone sets out to go rogue. Um, is there anything they should keep in mind? Um, well, just be truthful with themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't kid themselves. It, it's difficult for us to do that, all of us, isn't it? You, you build up your own reality, don't you, in life, whatever it is. Yeah. But you just be truthful with yourself. And then replicate that when you're communicating. There is, again, some stuff in the book about information flow from chair and CEO around to board to further and further out. And there's definitely things that one shouldn't release too far out mm -hmm. and one should solve uh, uh, rather than. So being very open with information is definitely wrong. Uh, but there are, we all have views about fairness and truth and everything. And so this is why it comes down to uh, character understanding when we build up the relationship to invest. Great. Well said. Okay, great. I'm going to summarize what we've discussed and we'll come back to you for any final thoughts. So back to topic number one, team dynamics, that investors invest in people with a plan and not the other way around. 
there's three types of money out there dumb cash smart cash and toxic cash pick which one you want very carefully number three uh good investors will find out the truth so uh yeah hope if you've got any skeletons a good investor will find them so disclose them early and uh, in terms of the number of co-founders peter said two is best and three is okay four really works so think about that now on to your startup is more likely to fail with investors than without the main thing you need to do is keep the confidence of your investors because you are going into loss making territory and you're going to need more cash more likely than not to keep fueling that growth otherwise you've got a big cash hole number two angels uh, generally won't follow on if things aren't going well so don't expect them to dip their hands into their pockets if you haven't been open with them and if you know there's the business looks like it's about to fail you know fundamentally not just because it's running out of cash and number three to bootstrap or equity i think do what's right for you is what i wrote down and peter you, you might have a, a opinion on that um and then finally bad behavior um, investors will do strange things. Do your homework on them. That's number two, reference your investors. And in terms of founder conduct and behavior, always be truthful with yourself. Now, Peter, do you want to add or take away anything from that summary? Well, I wouldn't take it away. And I think you summarized really well, including you're interviewing me at the same time as writing. So well done. No, no, no. There's obviously lots more, but it's, uh, there's nothing. That, that summary is excellent for what we've talked about. Great, superb. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, any other uh, rogue stories you want to share or interesting mm -hmm. anecdotes um, at this stage? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> um, I'm just about to write another chapter of the book, actually, um, which will be data analysis. I've got lots of data now, but some of which is on my website anyway. And the rest will be what I've learned in the last 14 years. And that will be peppered with stories um and actually this is the timing of this podcast is really good so once you send me send, send it back to me for checking whatever you can do or releasing then uh, you know i've said things uh which i know obviously but it just helps to have summarized in this way so no no there will be more in the next chapter of the book great i look forward to reading that and and now finally do you want to tell us where we can find you uh and the invested investor online and the books yeah so i run two separate websites, peterkelly.org, which is about me and my investments and my investment criteria and my um, data, et cetera, et cetera, and my exits, including the failures. I, 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 crossed, I sort of crossed my fingers slightly because I put a comment about why they failed on there. And I haven't had a lawyer's letter yet, but they haven't, haven't noticed it or they, believe, they, they agree, which seems unlikely, but whatever. So I've got that and I've got the investor investor. The investor investor was a, a uh, an organization I set up with my younger son, who's now a VC actually, um, uh, in, here in Cambridge, uh, four years ago. And it produced this, the first in this book, which was aimed at angels becoming better angels. Yeah. In fact, it, uh, <laughs> as a really Andy Phillips, you won't know the guy, but he said the company's called Booking.com, which you will have heard of mm -hmm. indirectly. Um, I've interviewed him twice on the podcast. He said the reason that angels won't, won't read this because there's many entrepreneurs work out how to get money from us and work with us is because they know it all from day one. Angel investors obviously <laughs> don't, but they think they do. So this is um, it's sort of a, it's written in the same way you're listening to me. So it's written in that sort of tone. Um, mm. So I definitely haven't recommend that. So there's three version version. It's book form, Amazon of course, Kindle, an audiobook version of that. Mm. Uh, a year or so later. This is a book called Founders Founder, which is 100 people I, I've interviewed uh, in various sectors, like hiring and firing and everything, and raising funding. And it's sort of tidbits of information for these 100 people. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we did, we've did done 75 podcasts um, mm -hmm. of all kinds of people in the ecosystem, entrepreneurs, angels, a bit of trade, body stuff, a bit of um, one or two professionals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's some really, really great stuff in there. Mm. The ones actually that slightly better listen to are the ones where there's two parts. So these yeah. people have been on an entrepreneurial journey and then become angel mm. investors. Because generally, it's true to say that uh, an angel investor, the smartness of it, is better delivered by an entrepreneur, as you'd expect. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely, fully agree. Uh, I was actually, you mentioned Andy Phillips, and I had the, the privilege of being lectured by him during my stint at London Business School on new venture development. And he told us all about the booking.com, you know, early stages of this new thing called the internet when everyone was using phones. Absolutely incredible and super inspiring. So yeah, I'm gonna take a listen to those episodes for sure. Yeah, they think of that one. He and I compete to decide who's more humble than each other. <laughs> and, and he definitely wins. <laughs> I agreed agreed yeah great okay well Peter thanks very much again um, amazing insights um, and um, there's so much more to, to read and listen to which I'm going to get stuck into so thanks again for joining me it's been a real pleasure as I thought it would be yeah Alex I really really enjoyed this one thank you very much indeed thanks Peter that's all for this episode keep tuning in for more exclusive insights from seasoned investors accomplished entrepreneurs and professional service advisors follow the tippy top blog on all major social media platforms including twitter tiktok insta facebook or now meta linkedin and of course you can find me alexander lee on linkedin and you can also check out my website thetippytop.com until next time keep pushing and i'll see you at the tippy top